So we're going to come to God's Word tonight for our Bible study. Uh, Two passages we're going to be looking at. The first is Mark chapter 7, and we're going to begin to read at verse 24. Uh, Mark chapter 7, verse 24, and then we're going to turn to James chapter 2, uh, beginning at verse 1 of James 2. But first of all, Mark chapter 7, and let's hear God's Word tonight. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. Yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. And then turning to James chapter 2, and we're beginning at verse 1. And so we read, My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. And then we move to verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by actions, is dead. And so we thank God for these two readings from his word of truth. Amen. We come then to our short Bible study tonight, and I want to begin by saying, Uh, something that I'm sure all of us would agree with tonight. We like to be first, don't we? First place seems to be the best place. First to be served in the restaurant. First place in the traffic queue. First in line in the shop. There's something that feels very good about being first. You see it happening so often on the motorway. A car overtakes another car. And the other car speeds up and then re-overtakes the car that just a moment or two overtook them. All because people get this idea, I want to be first. In the first Bible reading tonight from Mark's Gospel chapter 7 verses 24 to 37, we have before us the record of Jesus with what we might call a second place woman. And I wonder, can we just imagine for a moment or two how it must have felt when that Gentile woman, Sarah Phoenician by nationality, 
took her concern for her daughter to Jesus. And here's the response that Jesus gives. He says to this woman, first let the children, the children of course being the children of the chosen nation, let them eat all they want, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. I wonder how we might have handled such a slur on our people in the face of such a concern for a child of ours. How might we have felt if we had been that woman? How might we have reacted? How might we have responded? Why did Jesus answer the woman in such a way? It's interesting, if we read the verses before this encounter between Jesus and this uh, Gentile woman, we see that Jesus had been speaking to the Jews about what they considered to be clean and unclean. And you might, maybe later on this evening or in your quiet time, read through the beginning of that passage and look at that. But the bottom line was this. What's in a person's heart is what really counts. What's in a person's heart is the important thing, the determining factor. We read Jesus' words to the Pharisees and to the teachers of the law in verse 15. Nothing, says Jesus, outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. And again, moving on to verses 20 to 23, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. In the passage that we are looking at tonight in our short Bible study from Mark's Gospel, verse 24 onwards, Jesus had entered into unclean territory when he came into the regions of Tyre and Sidon. And when he came into that area, into that Gentile area, we read that the woman in humility, that woman fell at the feet of Jesus and she makes her plea to Jesus to help her daughter and to do something to meet her need. And Jesus' response is, first let the children eat all they want, for it is not right to take the children's bread and to toss it to the dogs. Jesus says this, after we read about this whole business of being clean and being unclean and about how it's what's in the heart that counts. It's what's on the inside that counts, not what is outward. And yet Jesus gives this response. And I suppose you could easily read that response and you could be forgiven for thinking, well, Jesus surely has fallen into the ways of his very own people dividing people into whom they deemed to be clean and unclean was something they were, they were very good at. And it seems, doesn't it, in the way that Jesus answers here, that he's doing something similar. Was his answer to this woman making a statement about the way his own people viewed the Gentiles? Was it for the benefit of someone in the house who's unnamed in this account? Was it to try and test how sincere the woman's faith was? In the words of one commentator, it would appear that we're left with a bit of a puzzle here. But one thing is for sure, this Gentile woman, she was on a mission. If we had been in her shoes, and let's try and put ourselves in her shoes tonight, if we'd been in her position, if we'd received the answer that Jesus gave to her, Perhaps we might have parted company with Jesus at this point. Perhaps we might have thought to ourselves, well, clearly I'm wasting my time and energy asking Jesus to help my daughter. In her time, in her culture, this woman was probably all too familiar with begging for her wants and begging for her needs. She was perhaps very used to being treated as a second-class person. But what we do know is that she did not get into a dispute 
with Jesus regarding what she may perceive him to, to have said to be a put down of her people. She doesn't get into an argument with Jesus. Rather, what she did say was simply this, but Lord, she says, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. In other words, this woman didn't get into a dispute. She didn't say a word about who she or who her people were. She didn't question what Jesus says to her. But what she did say was, in effect, even so, Lord, that might be the case, but we too have needs. Clearly, this woman's greater concern over and above who she was or, or where she was from or what her people were was the urgent, immediate need of her daughter. And that deep need drove her to Jesus. And she says to Jesus, in effect, Lord, will gladly take the leftovers. Now, it was the woman's response to Jesus which becomes the very thing that leads to Jesus granting her her request. So we read the following in verse 29. For such a reply you may go, for the demon has left your daughter. And one commentator actually writes, there are things in this story, this account, that we simply cannot grasp or understand. However, what we can grasp is that this Gentile woman knew exactly where to go to for help, that someone else's position or relationship didn't change her needs, that Jesus would be able to do what was needed for her daughter. This was her faith. And when the woman went back to her home, her child, we're told there in verse 30, was lying on the bed and the demon was gone. Her daughter had been delivered and set free. She was no longer under control of the evil spirit, reminding us surely tonight that God is no respecter of persons, but he is rich to all who call out to him, to all who call upon him in faith and in trust. Then we come to our second reading, which was from James chapter 2. And in James chapter 2, James is actually writing to address this whole business of discrimination within the church. Now, this time the division is not between the Jews and the Gentiles. Rather, it was between those who were rich, those who were wealthy, and those who were poor. And the discrimination against the poor in the church was that when they came in to worship the Lord, well, there was a problem as to how they were being treated and where they were being seated. The best seats, the reserved seats, the good seats, were being given to those who were well-dressed, well-turned out, those whom we're told wore gold rings. In fact, some commentators tell us that the rings may well have signified the person's status in the Roman social order. So, if you were a person who was important, the ring that you wore signified your status to others. And so, the people who were well-dressed, the people who were, we might say, the movers and the shakers within society, they were being fawned over and fussed over and made a big deal over while the poor, who came in their shabby clothes and had very little, they were asked, just you stand at the back out of the way or sit down at my feet. Keep yourself to yourself. That's what was happening to them when they came to worship. James begins chapter 2 by asking, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, you must not show favoritism. He firmly reminds his readers and reminds us tonight that second place has no place within the Christian family. God's Word clearly teaches that while man looks at the outward appearance, God himself looks always on the heart. Now, if we're spoken to by God's Word, then we must surely always ask ourselves when we read a verse of Scripture or a passage of Scripture, what is that verse or what is that passage saying to me as a Christian, to me as a child of God? And that's the question we want to, to ask ourselves tonight. 
If we have a need, or some of our dear loved ones within our family have a need, would we call out to the Lord Jesus, our Savior? Would we come into his presence and kneel in humility before him and cry out to him, bringing to him our request? Or would we worry, well, perhaps there are others who would be more important, others who would receive more favor? Would we worry that there might be other children of the kingdom who would come first? Or would we be determined as we call out to God in prayer that he would hear us, that he would answer our request? Yes, in accordance with his will, his plan, and his purposes, which are always best. Would we, as Christians, be persistent in our praying? Or would we give up easily and quickly? Surely there's something there for us all to think about as Christian folk. And there's something else as Christian folk that we do well to ask ourselves just in light of this short Bible study. It's a very important question to ask ourselves. What are my prejudices and what are your prejudices? If someone doesn't perhaps dress as we do, do we, we perceive them in a negative way? Many years ago, I attended, along with my brother-in-law, a church outreach event. Now, I'm not going to, to name the church, but it was a special week of events, a mission with a difference, if you like, where, you know, one of those types of outreach events where there's a different thing each night, maybe something for the young people, maybe something for the ladies of the congregation, something for the men. And one of the nights, it was to be a praise night and a testimony night. And invitations were being given out around the doors, around the community, for people to, to come along or, or to bring even better a friend. And so uh, Roderick and I came along, uh, my brother-in-law, and there was a man from the area that we had got to know a bit and we had helped him out a little bit. He had uh, an alcohol problem. He didn't have very much by way of furniture in his home because probably a lot of that, sadly, had been spent on alcohol. But uh, we had said to him, would you think about coming along with us? Would you go to this meeting? And after thinking about it, he eventually said, yeah, I'll go along. If you pick me up, I'll go along and hear what it's all about. And the night that we arrived to pick him up, he came out, and I can always remember this, he had what to him was his best clothes on. He had got a, a jacket that had seen better days, and he had got a shirt and a tie which totally didn't match, and, and it looked like the shirt was all grubby around the neck, if you can imagine, uh, and the tie had seen better days. But to him, in his mind, he had put on his best to come to that mission. And as we walked in through the door, and we looked around, because it was in the main church meeting house building like this, uh, and it was quite full, we'd arrived, we were looking for a seat, as we walked down the church aisle and considered where we might sit, because it was clear we were going to have to sit in beside somebody, honestly, you could see people aghast and people looking and thinking, I hope they're not going to sit in beside us. There was a bit of concern on their part. And I remember the man whispering to us and saying, maybe I shouldn't be here. And we said, no, 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 it's good that you're here. And we eventually got a seat and we sat down. And you know the amazing thing? Sometime after that, that man made a commitment to Christ. And that man went on a program to clean up his, his habits and his ways and went on with the Lord. And it really spoke to us and it really challenged us and others too who were there that night about how we perceive others and how we react to others. And yet, if we're all being honest, there are times when we've been just like that. I have to hold up my hands and say, There's t there are times, perhaps I'm sure, when I've been on a train or a bus or some in a public place and you see somebody go past and you think, oh, please don't sit beside me. Have you ever been in that position? I don't think any of us haven't. It's so easy for us, isn't it, to, to judge others by how they look and by how they come across and how they appear, even the way that we speak. 
It's easy, isn't it, for all of us to fall into the trap of either being impressed or equally not at all impressed by a person's appearance, the clothes they wear, their outward look. But surely what we need to do is make sure that we see each person as made in God's image. And that really ought to determine how we view others and how we treat others. We've got to remind ourselves that no one is beyond God's everlasting love. No one is beyond God's grace and mercy. It's just something for us to think about in a very practical way. And let's also think about that woman's faith, that Gentile woman who was not going to be put off and who came to the Lord and her faith was rewarded. So let's just seek God's face in prayer for a moment or two. Lord, we think of the, the lady whose name we're not given in the gospel account who comes to Jesus, pleading with him, help my daughter, deliver her from this demon. And even though Jesus made the remark that seemed to be a put down to this woman and to her background, she responded not by getting into an argument, by, but by simply saying, even the dogs need crumbs. Her faith was persistent, and Jesus responded to such faith by granting her request. We can't fully understand all the, the nuances, all that was going on in this account in Scripture, but the point is that this woman knew where to come to for help, to the Lord Jesus, and he did meet her need, need because of her great faith and the fact that she would not give up. Lord God, we pray that you would help us as Christians to be persistent in our praying, to not give up easily. Help us, Lord, to be encouraged to know that you're our Heavenly Father, that we can come to you in and through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, our Intercessor, we can bring our needs to you in the knowledge that you will hear our prayer, you will hear our request, you will answer in accordance with your plans and your purposes. Thank you, Lord, that it's not the case as we come to you that other people's prayers might be more important than ours, that we are loved of you. Lord God, as well, as we think about those words in the book of James about showing favoritism, forgive us, Lord, for the times when we can look down at others because of how they dress or their outward appearance. We can make certain judgments. Lord God, forgive us when we don't like certain people to be around us because they're not our sort of people. We pray instead, Lord, that you would give us a, a desire and a love to see all as important in your sight. May that determine how we treat them. And may they see in us that we love them because they are made in your image. Yes, Lord, help us to be able to share the gospel with others that we come across, but not in a judgmental way, but in a loving and tender way. We pray all of this in and through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we take a moment or two in silence just now, either at home or here in person, to bring our needs to you, just as the Gentile woman did, to come to you with those needs and lay them at your feet tonight. And also to pray for your forgiveness for the times, Lord, perhaps when we've held our own prejudices against others and we've let those things become obstacles in our love for others and our reaching out to others.
Lord, hear the prayers that we bring. And we bring our prayers together in that prayer that you have taught us, our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.